Welcome to this lecture series on uh, nano electronics uh, which will include a lot of discussion on devices as well as materials. This course will be taught jointly by three faculty members, I am Professor Navakant Bhatt. I will probably cover about one third of these uh, lecture series and subsequently two other colleagues of mine, Professor Shivashankar and Professor K. N. Bhatt will also cover rest of the course. We are from Center for Nano Science and Engineering which is a brand new department at the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore and uh, you can go to this website uh, which gives a uh, lot more details about uh, the center and uh, the capabilities of the center and the vision of the center and uh, so on and so forth. And the building that you see out here is uh, the new building which is uh, home to the center for nano science and engineering. It houses a state of the art nano fabrication facility uh, and uh, also a very extensive nano characterization facility. Okay, so, let us get uh, started uh, with the course, uh, just a uh, couple of logistics first. Uh, some of the, there is no textbook uh, really for uh, this course, uh, however, there are quite a few reference books, um, some of those are listed here uh, and uh, you know these consist of uh, two things, uh, two broad areas. Uh, that is uh, devices as I mentioned, uh, you know you can go through following uh, series of books uh, depending on uh, which topics that uh, you are interested in. Fundamentals of Modern VLSI Devices uh, by Yon Tar and Neng, uh, Cambridge University Press. Solid State Electron Devices uh, by Streetman and Banerjee, uh, which is a very classic uh, textbook on uh, semiconductor devices, especially for the basics of devices. Fundamentals of Electron Devices, uh, which is written by uh, Achyutan and Bhatt, K. N. Bhatt, who is also uh, you know a co instructor on uh, this course uh, that we have. Uh, then also, there is uh, one uh, a very important book uh, on uh, uh, MOS technology, which is uh, Metal Oxide Semiconductor uh, Physics and Technology by Nicolian and uh, Bruce, uh, which is also considered as the Bible for uh, MOS uh, technology. And then you know there is the other set of books on process technologies and materials, okay, uh, which include uh, Silicon VLSI technology by Plummer, Deal and Griffin, ULSI technology edited by SMZ, McGraw publication and also a very extensive uh, you know uh, topics on material characterization covered in uh, encyclopedia of uh, material characterization uh, published by Elsevier right so as i mentioned uh, in addition to uh, these reference book uh, books that i have listed during the course uh, uh, we will also point to uh, certain uh, publications uh, which have appeared in the recent uh, conferences and journals uh, that are also very relevant to understand the material that we are going to cover in this uh, course. Okay, so, uh, just to put things in perspective when we talk of nano electronics right. Uh, you know nano science of course, uh, is the most fundamental aspect. Uh, just as the macro counterpart at nano scale, uh, the nano science essentially talks about you know studying phenomenon, whether it is physical phenomenon, chemical phenomenon or biological phenomenon, but most importantly at length scales which are less than 100 nanometer right. That is what we broadly classify as nano science. Now, when we talk of nanotechnology, what we are saying again just analogous to the macro counterpart based on the understanding that we gather uh, after studying nano science, we would like to make use of that understanding and create useful products right. That is what technology is all about. The distinction here is that the products are created with at least one building block right. Products will have multiple building blocks in them any product for that matter 
at least one building block should be at length scale which is less than 100 nanometer. If that is the case then you know we call that product as a nanotechnology product or nanotechnology enabled product. As uh, most of you know there has been a very tremendous uh, activity in nanoscience and nanotechnology in the last few years all over the world and we can certainly say that nanoelectronics which happens to be one of the branches of nanotechnology. You see in nanotechnology we can talk of nanomaterials, nanobiotechnology, nanoelectronics, nanomechanics and so on and so forth. Out of this uh, I can argue that nanoelectronics is probably the most mature of nanotechnology and in fact nanoelectronics is the most successful commercial manifestation of nanoscience and nanotechnology. Right? So, when we are talking of nanoelectronics, we use nanoelectronics enabled products in our day to day life, although we may not really know about that. Right? And the most important thing uh, to uh, look ahead is that nanoelectronics growth in future relies on innovations in new materials and new device structures. Only then we can create new nanoelectronics products in the future. Right? So, this course is essentially trying to address that aspect right uh, a very specific uh, aspect of nanotechnology as I mentioned which is nanoelectronics and to be able to go along the nanoelectronics path in future what do we need to do in terms of materials technology and device technology right and that is what we uh, you know hope to cover uh, during this course. Just to get a feel for uh, perspectives on uh, length scale, uh, what I have tried to do here is to sort of juxtapose two different uh, uh, areas. You know, one is of course biology that we are all made of, right, and electronics that we create, right. As you know, biology is of course based on uh, carbon, whereas electronics is entirely based on silicon. Right, you know that is a underlying distinction out here. This is carbon atom, which is sort of, uh, of course, you will have other atoms as well. But carbon is the most fundamental uh, aspect out here. Whereas here, in addition to silicon, you will also have various other things. But you know, silicon is essentially the enabler. Right. Now, when we are talking of atomic scale, right, we are really talking of of the order of hundred picometers. Right. Uh, uh, you know on the screen for some reasons these numbers are not coming out properly, but what you have here in terms of these horizontal lines out here this is 100 meters, this is 100 millimeter, 100 micrometer, 100 nanometer and 100 picometer right. Three orders of magnitude decrease in length scale. Okay. Now in this area out here which is less than 100 nanometer right this is the bar that we have you know in biology we have of course in addition to carbon atom then the building block of life which is DNA and cell nucleus all these essentially fall in this domain right. And similarly in the electronics counterpart uh, you know in addition to the silicon atom you have the gate oxide which falls in this regime and the gate lens that we talk about today are also in this regime right. Using this fundamental constructs that we have you know we then construct uh, higher level abstractions right uh, in electronics of course we do that but in biology nature does that right we don't uh, still don't know how to do that right but you know the the idea here is that then we talk of uh, red blood cells human arteries human hair you know this is a very classic example that was given when we were uh, talking about microelectronics right just to give uh, the length perspective here as you know less than 100 nanometer i already told you is nanotechnology Right. If you are less than 100 micrometer, but more than 100 nanometer, then you are really in the regime of micro technology in general. And if that micro technology applies to electronics, then you know we are doing microelectronics. Right. So when we started doing microelectronics way back in uh, 50s and 60s, the classic example that was given was that we built transistors which are of the size less than diameter of the human hair. Right. Diameter of the human hair is about 100 micrometer. Right. Then you know between 100 micrometer to 100 millimeter you have mesoscale technologies right. Uh, you know if you talk about electronics you know if you look at cache memory size or a microprocessor die or even a package chip right that will probably fall in this uh, uh, kind of length scale that we are talking about right. Uh, 
Then of course, you know using this we build a, a variety of electronics product right. Uh, you know, uh, so this is the big distinction, right? You know, I've also sort of indicated here. Biology has really figured out how to build the systems which are also, you know, uh, benign to the environment. Meaning that, you know, once uh, uh, the living organism ceases to live, right? You know, it's biodegradable, right? Whereas, you know, disposing electronics waste has become one of the biggest challenge today, right? You know, these are some of the things, uh, you know we have still not been able to figure out although we have been saying that today we can create a computer which can be as as powerful as a, as a human brain which of course is a very debatable point right but nonetheless uh, we have not been able to do it uh, with the efficiency that uh, biology has been doing right so in other words the point to also understand here is that there are, uh, there are two two important uh, messages that i would like to drive home here right in future especially in the era of the nanotechnology right we there is a there is going to be a very strong interaction between biology and electronics on one hand we would like to build electronics which we would call as bio inspired electronics really trying to mimic how the brain does computation right i mean uh, uh, the way we do digital computation is quite different from uh, how biological systems uh, do computation right so that is one aspect right related to that aspect is also the the point of uh, you know self healing architectures you know redundancy in uh, electronics and so on and so forth which is to sort of learn from biology right on the other hand i think one of the most important uh, you know application area for electronics is really to apply electronics in biology in the next uh, couple of decades right in terms of really building uh, sensors for biological application, diagnostic tools, uh, you know, so called lab on chip devices and so on and so forth, right. So, although, you know, when we started the discussion on this slide, we said that, you know, these two systems seem to be distinct, right, but there is going to be a lot of uh, synergy going forward among these two, so uh, seemingly which appear quite different, right, I think they will have to coexist. And in fact, that is why there is so much interest in nano electronics and nanotechnology because today we have the capability of building transistors or electronic components which are at the same scale as that of the building blocks of life, right. And that is where we can actually start interfacing the electronics and biology at their fundamental uh, uh, length scales, right. So, uh, you know you need to keep this in mind although in this course we are not going to cover anything on application of electronics in biology or bio inspired electronics and so on and so forth. These are very good research topics uh, to look forward to. We will only focus on the silicon CMOS technology and also some other materials which are going to complement the silicon technology right. So, that is going to be the emphasis of uh, this course right. Okay, so, let us move on then. So, what is the big picture of electronics right? Uh, you know electronics is very distinct right. I mean you compare electronics industry with any other industry for example, automobile right. Uh, what is distinct about electronics as I already pointed out this is the only industry where you can create intelligence you see we create intelligence on silicon right and that is why electronics is is really an enabling uh, manufacturing uh, field right. In fact, it is predicted that if you look at a high end automobile today most of the cost I would say easily more than 50 percent of the cost is really in electronics because it is this electronics which brings intelligence to automobile right. I mean same is true with any other industrial segment. In other words, electronics industry has a far reaching impact on various other industrial segments that we have right. And there was a very interesting survey conducted by uh, uh, a body in European Union a while ago which said that the electronics industry growth in the last few years was twice as much as world GDP right just imagine that right you know that is the kind of growth that we have uh, in electronics right. So, how is it enabled the big picture of electronics is that we construct these chips which will do either uh, you know computation as is indicated here or storage right. 
you know any field that you would like to look at there is a lot of information that you gather. So, you need to store information and you need to process information right. The electronic chips enable us to do that. When we talk of computation it could be a microprocessor or a microcontroller or a DSP chip or a network processors and so on and so forth right. All these essentially take in digital inputs and digital bits and manipulate these bits right do lot of computation on these bits. Having done that you need to store the result right I mean then you need storage elements right. These storage elements could be a static random access memory or a dynamic random access memory flash memory and so on and so forth right. So, when we talk of a device the device essentially stores and manipulates the computational state variable today most of the time we are essentially talking of digital electronics right. So, uh, essentially it is a binary uh, digital logic that we built till today. So, you know computational variable has two states uh, and we manipulate this computational state variable ok. Computational state variable can take one of several forms, but today it essentially takes the form of voltage which comes about because we store charge on the circuit nodes that we have in CMOS circuits right. And uh, you know this is how we build electronics right. So, any electronics chip that you have no matter what chip it is fundamentally it either does computation or it does storage ok. Now, if you go and put an electronic chip under a microscope under an optical microscope this is what you will see ok. Uh, you will see a regular patterns on an electron I mean on optical microscope ok as is indicated here if it is a chip in this example I have taken Intel Pentium chip you will have you may not know that unless you are a designer, but the one person who has designed it would know that ok there is a data cache here you know there is a floating point unit here and so on and so forth right. So, this is what you will see when you look at the plan view or a top view and it does not matter which chip you look at you know this is another example of one of the chip that we had designed at ISC which was a neural net chip. Again you see some regular arrangement of some building blocks right. And in other words integrated circuit chip is really silicon floor planning just as when you build a house you do floor planning right uh, to begin with right. Similarly, you need to decide uh, how many blocks should be there on your silicon chip where should the blocks be placed and so on and so forth. This is the task that is done by a chip designer as far as the subject matter of this course is concerned we are not going to talk about chip design ok. Instead what we will do is really to ask the question what is inside the chip ok. I mean you got that die, die is essentially a piece of silicon on which you have made the chip right. You have put it under an opt optical microscope, but if you take a cross section now you cut this silicon piece and take a side view what will you see right. What you will see is essentially a very large ensemble of transistors which are connected appropriately right this is a key depending on how you connect them how you interconnect them you get a particular function right you may get a memory function you may get a microprocessor function and so on and so forth right. And in order to do that you will also have large number of metal interconnection lines ok. So, when you do the cross section at the very top right uh, you probably will see a multi level metal interconnects today's state of the art chip can easily have more than 10 layers of metal lines right. For example, this is the top metal line and underneath there will be you know another metal line and so on and so forth and eventually you will reach silicon. On silicon you have a transistor and this is what is your transistor right and today we are only talking about MOS transistor when we talk of CMOS it is complementary metal oxide semiconductor transistor. If you look at any electronics today more than 90 percent of the electronics that is built today is based on CMOS technology a very very small fraction ok maybe less than 5 percent is by bipolar junction technology either on silicon or MOSFETs on gallium arsenide and so on and so forth right. So, majority of the silicon electronics that you see is CMOS and hence the entire focus of this course is going to be on CMOS ok. And this is what you will see at the very bottom on silicon right you will have constructed a silicon MOS transistor which will have you know a source terminal inside silicon a drain terminal inside silicon 
and a gate oxide we will see a blown up version little later and a gate electrode right it is essentially a three terminal device. Well strictly speaking it is a four terminal device there is also a body terminal but we will ignore that for the time being right. So today's modern chip will have close to billion such transistors on a very small silicon area silicon area could be 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter in other words you will have you know a square silicon die about 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter and inside this you would have put close to 1 billion transistors just amazing population density of the transistors right on silicon <laughs> okay if you have billion transistor on such a tiny area they need to be interconnected right and that is why we need multi level interconnects right otherwise i can't pack them in 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter if i am given only 3 layers of metal interconnect maybe this chip will have to be 5 centimeter by 5 centimeter or whatever that is right so that is why over the generation of the silicon technology we have also increased the number of metal interconnects and you know this is what you see in fact you know if you have an artistic uh, view you know in fact somebody had remarked that today we are building cities on silicon right these look like a flyovers <laughs> that you see in uh, modern cities today okay so this is the kind of uh, uh, things that you will see inside a silicon right and the entire focus of this course is only on transistors we will not even talk about interconnects right so that is how focused this course will be right the next uh, 45 lectures or so huh? maybe we will you know have a, a brief uh, reference to interconnects in one of the lecture but that is not going to be a theme right the reason simply is that you see in silicon chips transistor is the active element interconnects are passive elements right it is active element which is doing all the functions right it doesn't mean that the passive elements are not important but you know it is very important to design the active element right okay and that is why you know we will only focus on the transistors right Okay. So, as I mentioned metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor right this is what we are going to look at right. A very simple model for a transistor is you know you can abstract it as a switch right. So, there is a control input that you have in a switch right and a signal will pass from input to the output. If the control input has the right condition then the switch could be closed and then you have input signal propagating to the output otherwise switch is open you know it is a very very abstraction okay. When we talk of doing circuit we come up with what is called a schematic abstraction of a transistor right. So, this is how you will represent a schematic of a n channel MOS transistor it will have a gate terminal it will have a drain terminal which will drain the carriers it will have a source terminal which will source the carriers right. The carriers could be electrons and holes and accordingly we will have two flavors of transistors we will see in a minute. Look at the top view as I mentioned already this is what you see you know some regular arrangement of rectangles or you know some st structures right this is what you see. But what we are really interested in is cross section okay. So, as I mentioned you will have n channel transistor or n MOSFETs and p channel transistor and if you build chips combining n and p channel transistor and that is your complementary metal oxide semiconductor technology right and you know your n channel transistor will be built in a p well which will have n plus drain n plus source and a gate insulator which is what we call oxide and a gate terminal and similarly you have a complement of this and that is why the name complementary metal oxide semiconductor wherever you have you have p n you have replaced that with p you have p plus in fact these will typically be represented as n plus n plus which means they are very heavily doped n region okay n plus does not mean that you know n is of course electrons are majority carriers electrons do not have positive charge right electrons have negative charge plus here indicates the doping concentration okay very heavily doped uh, n plus uh, regions out here and here you have very heavily doped p regions right uh, source and drain regions and insulator is same n well they are built on n well and a gate insulator and you know they have complementary characteristics right with respect to the voltage that you apply to the gate this is what we call gate voltage right Vg. You will have the transistor conducting very very little current ideally zero current when it is off but it is never the case as becomes as it becomes clear later on in the course. It will have very small non-zero current 
and if you appro uh, apply the appropriate voltage you know n channel transistor will turn on right. So, this is off state for n channel transistor and this is on state for an n channel transistor. The p is exactly complement of this right when n is off p will be on and that is why it is conducting large current out there and when n is on p will be off correct. So, this is how we build uh, you know uh, circuits based on the uh, transistors right. So, in other words uh, if you look at the integrated circuit hierarchy right we can classify broadly that there is a technology domain which enables the construction of the building blocks of chips transistors and interconnects that is where you need to have very good knowledge of device physics only if you know device physics you can come up with very innovative designs of transistors and having gotten that design you need to build that that is where you need appropriate process technology you need to use appropriate materials and sequence of processes to build that transistor. This is what we call a technology domain. If you look at any foundries silicon foundries that is not mechanical foundries they essentially do this they do silicon chip fabrication they focus on device physics and process technology ok. Whereas, when we talk of application domain this is where the designers system designers and chip designers are working on they talk about what kind of system architecture they want to build for example, if it is a microprocessor you know you know what kind of architecture you know should it be CISC architecture or a RISC architecture things like that if you are building an ADC what kind of an ADC analog to digital converter that you want to build successive approximation or flash A to D converter. So, this kind of system architecting happens here and once you do the system architecting you do the circuit design right at the fundamental building block which is transistor you need to architect the circuit design the circuit and do the layout only when you do the layout you complete your design then pass the design on to the foundry. Then the foundry can take the design run it through all the processes and build your chip right. So, this is really an extremely interdisciplinary area you see you need lot of understanding of uh, materials chemistry out here good understanding of physics good understanding of circuits computer science or whatever that application domain is and of course, mathematics to develop models computer design is key here right. We do lot of CAD both in the technology domain as well as uh, you know circuit uh, uh, domain right. So, today as I mentioned our process technology is based on silicon our devices are CMOS complementary metal oxide semiconductor and our computational variable as I said charge and hence we are not going to talk anything about for example, using spin as a logic variable right. So, called the area of spintronics right that is not at all going to be discussed in this course right. And of course, we build circuits today based on Boolean logic digital architecture this is where the point I mentioned earlier that bio inspired circuit could be quite different from you know digital architecture and Boolean logic right. Uh, but again we will not really discuss uh, too much about that we need to really do optimization across all these domains only then we can get a very high performance integrated circuit right that is the key otherwise we will not be able to uh, do that. Any discussion on uh, you know scaling and nano electronics is incomplete in my opinion without reference to Moore's law ok. You might have heard about this Moore's law, but let me just walk you through that. Gordon Moore uh, published a paper way back in 1975 1965 I am sorry this was also published in a trade journal called electronics ok. The paper was titled cramming more components onto integrated circuit that was the title of the paper. It is a very interesting paper easy to read you know uh, you just google it you will certainly get this paper on the internet right. Uh, what he did there are lot of things that he discusses, but there is one very interesting that thing that he did right he constructed a graph right which is shown out here. Uh, what he did in this graph on x axis he put the year timeline is on x axis on y axis he put the number of components per integrated uh, function ok. Uh, essentially what it mean, mean, means is that 
by the way this graph first of all is plotted on a semi log sheet ok. So, this is log scale here uh, y axis is a log scale ok and x axis is a linear scale. All he did was he took integrated circuit chip introduced in any given year and counted how many transistors were integrated on that chip on that given year right. So, number of transistor is plotted on y axis ok and uh, year is on the x axis and he did not have too many data points you see the first integrated circuit was invented way back in 1958 if you may recall the first IC was invented by Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments that was in 1958 right. The first semiconductor transistor itself was way back in 1947 right which was a bipolar junction transistor not a MOS transistor although in this course we only talk about MOS transistor that is an irony right. The first semiconductor transistor was indeed bipolar junction transistor although you know the scientists at Bell Labs were really trying to make a MOS transistor, but making an MOS transistor was so difficult they ended up doing a bipolar junction transistor right. But that apart the data points are only from 1958 till the year 1965 when he wrote this particular paper right. So, you know he has about 5 data points here he noticed that it fits a straight line right. In other words because it is a semi log sheet it indicated that the number of transistors that were put on the chips were increasing exponentially over the time. In particular at least during that period the number of components or transistor was doubling every year ok. But the lot of credit is given to Moore because of this dotted line that he has in this paper you see. Uh, you know this is not uh, based on any data point you see this was written in 1965 obviously no chip was done uh, in subsequent years at that time. The point he made here was that this will continue to happen in the years to come mm, that was a very very bold prediction ok. Uh, at least what he said was that he does not see any fundamental uh, impediments from science ok. It is only the limitations of technology if any we are not able to construct that, but otherwise we should be able to increase the number of transistors exponentially over the years right. And indeed subsequently there was a paper published in IEEE spectrum in 1970 right uh, again it is a very interesting paper you can go back and read that. And what is done here is that now there are a few more data points on x axis because this was uh, you know uh, published uh, subsequently right. And what you see is that these are the original data points which were published in the Moore's paper and you see that all subsequent data points are also on the same line right it has continued to happen. Hmm. In fact Moore wrote in his handwriting out here on uh, you know sometime in 1996 you know a very interesting uh, he says the uh, the definition of Moore's law has come to refer to almost anything related to the semiconductor industry make a note of that almost anything related to semiconductor industry right. That when plotted in a semi log paper is a straight line right. <laughs> right. So, you see Moore's law is not a fundamental science law it is not a law in physics for example you know it is it is a very very bold prediction that was made by Moore. You take feature size or the dimension of the transistor plot it as a function of year meaning this is year and this is the transistor size let us say length of the transistor. If this is log scale we see that over the years the length of the transistor has decreased exponentially. Any anything that in semiconductor industry you know goes according to this law right. But you see the key here is really this because we are able to miniaturize the transistors because we are able to miniaturize this this will happen. If we had not done this there is no way we can cram more components onto integrated circuit right. This key here the message here is scaling we need to scale technology in fact we will have more discussion in one of the future lecture why do we need to scale in the first place apart from putting more transistor in a given real estate of silicon there are various other advantages of scaling as well. We will discuss a lot more of that in one of the future lectures ok. 
Of course, Moore not only did this prediction, but he also proved his vision. You, need, you see, Moore co-founded Intel, one of the technological giants in electronics, right? Gordon Moore and uh, Robert Noyes co-founded Intel way back, and of course, you know, uh, because microprocessor happened, then of course, you know, there was an explosive growth of electronics, right? Before that, we had only memories. Memory chips were there, of course, right? But memory chips were only for storage. The real intelligence comes that is information processing comes because of microprocessor or any of these logic chips okay and very interesting uh, point i always tell my students is that uh, you know gordon moore actually had a degree in chemistry okay although he went on to lead a technological giant in electronics industry right so there is really no barriers in uh, science and technology right if you have you know um, real uh, uh, liking for any field you can you know pick up that at any point in time of course you need to have perseverance and interest uh, and you, you should really want it right only then you will get it okay okay so this is uh, just the same data uh, just to sort of uh, uh, highlight this in from uh, what is called international technology roadmap for semiconductors uh, 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 this is uh, uh, an authoritative body ITRS as is indicated here again you know you can google uh, ITRS uh, you get lot of information right uh, at least uh, I would recommend uh, uh, everybody who is interested in nano electronics to really take a look at ITRS website it has lot of interesting technical information out there what ITRS does is to look at the history and make prediction for future make prediction for future based on not only historical trends, but also based on a fairly good understanding of current capabilities and where is science heading in future right. It is not like kite flying future prediction right, right. the future prediction are done uh, very consistently. But more importantly ITRS revises its technology roadmap every year right. You go to ITRS website and you can take a look at all the previous uh, technology roadmaps right only by having that yearly revision and upgrade you know you can have these roadmaps current right. But what is plotted here again on x axis is year of production okay going from 1995 the prediction is of course all the way to 2020 okay today we are somewhere around uh, 2012. Hmm. What is plotted on y axis are multiple things okay uh, product functions per chip is what it broadly uh, indicates, but what is plotted is flash memory number of bits that you can make on a chip and uh, if it is a single level cell in flash memory you can also build what is called a multi level cell. If it is a multi level cell chip how many bits can you put in a chip, if it is a microprocessor unit right then how many transistors that you can put on a chip. Okay. And uh, again there are different kinds of microprocessor called high performance microprocessor, low power microprocessor different flavors. Okay. This is also a different flavor of a microprocessor. If it is a DRAM how many bits can you put? Can I make 16 GB DRAM, 32 GB DRAM and so on and so forth. So, this line right essentially says that all these products their capabilities are increasing exponentially over the years okay. and this is happening because of miniaturization. Right, that is the key. Otherwise, you know, we would not be able to uh, do this. Yes, this is the point, right. Now, the previous curve comes about because of this. Again, on the x axis, I have the years, and on the y axis, uh, you know, what we call as a feature size. Okay, there are multiple things that are plotted here called product half pitch, gate length and so on and so forth. Again for multiple products for DRAM, for microprocessor, for flash and so on and so forth. All of them have the same trend. The feature size is decreasing over the calendar year. Of course, the, the graph that you have at the, at the very uh, bottom is essentially the gate length. You see this is the gate length. The gate length of the transistor that is the lowest dimension using this you build other constructs right pitch will be half pitch will be little more than the gate length and so on and so forth okay we will talk more about that later. Now this point here is an important point I want you to look at 
and in fact that is where it says nanotechnology era begins in electronics. When did it begin? It began in 1999 not today ok. It began in 1999 which is almost 13 years ago. Today we are talking of 2012 right. Although you know there was not much fanfare right because electronics for, for electronics it was just an evolution you know you are doing little more than 100 nanometer you cross that 100 nanometer barrier right. So, what is the big deal kind of right. So, uh, there was not much uh, fanfare about uh, saying oh we have a nanotechnology product. Right, but the fact that now we have so much hype on nanotechnology, it's not just hype. You see, we have been using nanotechnology product at least electronic, as mentioned nano electronics. The building nanometer have been used in chips since 1999. Okay, and of course we are continuing to scale this, and very soon, of course, we will also cross the 10 nanometer barrier. Okay, that is how small we will be building the transistor. Okay. So, in other words what have we done? We have taken a MOS transistor which is the building block remember that source drain a well or a substrate a gate insulator and a gate electrode okay. and made it smaller and smaller and smaller over the years. Hmm. This is all silicon CMOS right as I mentioned the first transistor was not CMOS BJT and first few years right in 50s uh, it, we were essentially building chips based on bipolar junction transistor. The MOS transistor was actually invented although concept was very well known way back in 30s and 20s it was actually made possible only in 1964 okay. and then of course in 1960s once we made MOS transistor the technology was just silicon CMOS it just displaced bipolar junction technology, but we took the fundamental building block and just made it smaller and smaller. That is how we have uh, uh, been doing the business uh, in the last uh, few years, but today we are facing some very fundamental challenges in making this transistor smaller in future, because we are really hitting some fundamental limit. There is a lot of gate tunneling current. We used to say that the insulated gate MOS transistor has an insulated gate. If I apply voltage on the gate, no current flows through the gate terminal because there is an insulator that is no longer true now. Okay. This causes lot of problems, we need to overcome that problem. There is lot of issues with channel quantization. Okay. The channel here between source and drain is so small okay, that the quantization effects cannot be neglected and the transport itself is no longer drift diffusion based transport right. It is becoming quasi ballistic transport right. So, if we have to scale in the future miniaturize the transistor in the future we can do that only if you have new materials and new device structures ok. Otherwise you know there is no way we can go down to 15 nanometer kind of dimensions right. Now, uh, there is uh, one important point uh, that I want to bring up here is something called technology life cycle right. This also gives you a feel uh, the pace of electronics right. You know at least uh, from the point of view of uh, using electronics products right. Uh, you see the best way to best time to buy electronics product is always tomorrow right. If you want to buy a cell phone you wait till tomorrow because you get a better cell phone with better features for a lower cost right. You will buy a cell phone today and your friend will buy one six months down the line and you will curse yourself why did I buy this right six months ago right. You know technology is becoming obsolete so fast right. If you look at the history the way things are happening is that a new technology cycle starts emerging at timeline this let us say reference 0 is reference x axis is month it takes about 2 years to develop a new technology. During this period you know you are working on your uh, equipments, you are working on your processes, you are working on your device structures and so on and so forth, but there is no product in the market really. However, you will be seeing lot of papers published in the conferences leading conferences and journals right and very quickly you figure out how to make a product using this because making a single transistor is one thing making billion transistors all of which are working properly and interconnect them appropriately is a marvelous feat right. That is where you need to uh, you know have lot of uh, learning right that comes about 
and you actually start making uh, products right you start selling chips what is plotted here is volume parts per month okay and here the parts here is chips per month and here wafers per month right you know 20 wafers can give you 10000 chips right this is 10k here this is 220 200 and so on and so forth the scales are different okay because each wafer can support a uh, large number of chips you see okay so then of course the production ramps up and you really have large number of uh, chips porting to a new technology at the same time in the r and d there will be a new wave that will start right you start working on a new generation of the technology you know it's it's sort of ongoing right and that is why you have uh, continuous uh, miniaturization introduction of new technology nodes and so on and so forth right and that is a very unique thing about electronics uh, unparalleled compared to any other industrial segments uh, this is only industrial segment the cost of your product is decreasing every year with more functionality right so what are the projections for the next few years right this is taken from uh, itrs roadmap uh, as i mentioned you should go and look at the itrs roadmap okay <coughs> You know, today we have uh, something like uh, 45 and 32 nanometer technology in volume production. Okay, um, you know, in future we will of course go down to something like 11 nanometer uh, technology node. Okay, there are multiple metrics here. Technology node is quite different. There is also something called transistor gate length, right? when I am building uh, chips on so called 45 nanometer technology the transistor dimension may actually be much less than that you know I may be making transistor whose gate length is as small as 20 nanometer right. There is a big difference between the so called technology label uh, which is derived based on a definition of half pitch okay, as the actual gate be much smaller right when you have the gate dimension and spacing equivalent then the gate length becomes equal to half pitch okay whereas if the gate length is much smaller and spacing is much larger then half pitch is more than gate length you see there is a distinction between the technology node definition which is derived from the half pitch that is you have one transistor here you have another transistor here so this is the pitch right hmm. how closely pack the transistors okay and if the spacing and dimensions were to be identical half pitch and gate length would be identical but that is not the case right we miniature the gate length more aggressively we can pack the transistors together okay so that is why there is a difference out here wafer diameters today we are building silicon chips on 12 inch wafer diameter right these are like you know big dinner plates that you have 12 inch wafer diameter the reason being that if you have 12 inch wafer you can populate large number of chips right that is how you know you can reduce the cost of chip you will have so many chips from a single wafer okay and of course in order to do that you have to go through a very complex process steps you will probably go through at least uh, 35 photolithography steps in the nanofab facility okay the number of transistors that you are talking about is about uh, 2 billion transistors that you would integrate okay and uh, you know number of interconnects as I mentioned you know something like more than 10 that I already mentioned because you have so many transistor you need to be able to interconnect them right that is why you need large number of interconnects right. And uh, of course today we are talking of ultra low voltage operation right about 1 volt is what the supply voltage for all these chips they are no longer you know your 5 volt chips you know at if you apply 5 volt the transistor will dry instantaneously okay so the supply voltage has to be very very low of the order of 1 volt okay and of course you know very large number of uh, packaged uh, pins right you can never remember the pin out of the chip right 1450 packaged pins right very interestingly out of this 1450 at least for microprocessor kind of chip at least two thirds of these pins are only vdd and ground pins right that is required uh, to bring in supply into the chip from multiple uh, regions so that you can minimize the noise because your chip is working only at 1 volt right you need to make sure that you do not have much noise margin here you need to make sure that you minimize the noise right and that is a, that is why you need to be able to distribute your 
so called power network very efficiently ok. And of course, because we do that we get very high performance we talk of frequencies upwards of 10 gigahertz and of course, uh, we also consume very large power today you know state of the art microprocessor is consuming more than 100 watt this is also becoming a serious issue it is as if you have a 100 watt light bulb sitting in your uh, CPU box right you know that is the kind of uh, power dissipation that we have in these chips. Another important point I wanted to bring about is that <coughs> just because uh, we have a newer and newer technology introduced almost every 2 years it does not mean that all older generation technologies are obsolete ok. Each technology has its relevance and size does not fit all. All it means is that the highest performance the so called leading and bleeding edge chip such as microprocessor very high performance flash DRAM and what have you that will immediately go on to the new technology node ok. What this is a very interesting plot again x axis is year timeline ok, but y axis is a very interesting plot out here you know this essentially is a worldwide wafer production across technologies. If you look at 1997 along this 1997 you have actually created another x y graph ok on out here WPC refers to wafer production ok and here this refers to the feature size way back in 1997 we had only technologies going up to 0.5 micron that is why along this horizontal line you do not have any data points coming down here ok. The technology the best technology that you had stopped there ok. You had lot of products out here but at that time 1 micron technology which was state of the art maybe in 1990 continued to stay there for niche application ok. So, there was wafer production to make 1 micron chips as well and as you go along the years you see along this line there are new rectangles that are being added you see right. All that means is that today you know if I look at 2007 it is not today of course 5 years ago you see in addition to this there are new rectangles added which corresponds to different generations of the technology right going all the way to 90 nanometer technology back then. If I construct this plot today it will go all the way down to 45 nanometer, but the point to note here is that of course, the highest performance chip will immediately go to the latest current technology, but even then you still have worldwide wafer production happening on 0.5 micron technology 0.7 1 micron and so on and so forth. Just to give an example if you want to make a very high power chip ok you want to drive several watts uh, you know into you know your audio amplifier or what have you right. Then I cannot uh, do that with 1 volt right I need to maybe use uh, 5 volt or 10 volt then the only way I can construct is using 1 micron bigger transistors because if I go to you know, smaller transistors the transistor will just die as I said they will break down ok. So, each technology has its relevance, but the point is that the leading edge technology will occupy most of the business because most of the business really comes from the very high end chips like microprocessors and uh, you know uh, very high capacity memories and so on and so forth. In addition to this there is something interesting happening for last few years uh, and that is uh, something called uh, building sensors on uh, silicon ok. So, called CMOS sensors uh, pr presumably these will become next technology drivers ok. In other words if you see last few decades in every decade there was a technology driver right way back uh, you know in 1970s until microprocessor happened we had only memory chips ok. Then of course, you had microprocessor chips the pro microprocessor was invented and 1990s was really internet era right internet was invented and you had lot of new chips the so called network chips chips which enable networking came about. It does not mean that we did not fabricate processor we did not fabricate memory we continue to do that, but there is a new vector that has emerged ok. In the last decade you know it is really an explosion of handheld devices right and accordingly we had large number of chips which enabled uh, you know your cell phone PDAs digital cameras and so on and so forth. I think next couple of decades really is going to be 
you know in terms of systems we will really be building so called wireless sensor network based system right or so called ambient intelligence right. We need to be able to have very low cost sensors spread all around which will uh, collect lot of information in real time and uh, you know make sense out of it right. In order to do that we should really enable a large number of sensor chips right. So, this is also something that is happening although in this course we will not really talk about sensor right. But when we talk of nano electronics this is also a very very important uh, aspect. In other words we talk of what is called more more and more than more. What we mean by more more is essentially this is conventional electronics we are building computational units such as CPU logic and storage units such as memories right all that we are doing is miniaturization okay and this is what is happening as per the moore's law we are miniaturizing scaling and so on and so forth more than more is essentially along with electronics trying to embed something different right to begin with along with digital you may say i want to embed analog and rf functions then i want to embed passives such as inductors capacitors on the same chip then also I want to embed high voltage high power transistors on the same chip which has low voltage low power transistors. Then taking it further sensors and actuators and biochips and so on and so forth right. This is the vector that we will not really talk about uh, ok. So, we will restrict ourselves only to what we call traditional scaling right. What I call traditional scaling is essentially shrinking feature size we take the building block which is transistor we are only looking at electrical domain make the transistor smaller and smaller the technology drivers have been memory and logic the technology drivers will continue to be memory and logic along the traditional scaling path. The materials and devices are silicon and its derivative classical CMOS is what we had going forward silicon will coexist with a variety of materials that will be the focus of this course we will talk quite a bit not only on silicon on germanium on compound semiconductors and so on and so forth right. In addition to that device architecture not only CMOS we will also talk about non classical CMOS ok that will also form a significant uh, chunk of uh, the course uh, that we have ok. Whereas, this equivalent scaling path is really staying at the same dimension not necessarily miniaturizing but doing functional integration add more functions to the chip not just compute and storage, but add you know sensing and actuation this is what we call hybrid systems on chip or SOCs. Silicon will coexist with variety of functional materials polymer, piezo, ferroelectric, magnetic so on and so forth. In terms of devices not only CMOS, but MEMS chemical sensor biological sensors everything will be sort of integrated on a single chip ok. So, we would need uh, uh, new materials also to be able to do that ok. This as I said is going to be the uh, emphasis of this course new materials and new device structure right. So, you know what I will do at this time uh, you know is just flash this periodic table for you to go back and think about uh, you know of course, you know silicon is out here in column 4 which is a semiconductor and our entire electronics is based on silicon right. In addition to silicon there are lot of other materials uh, we will see in the next lecture that uh, what it used to be until 10 years ago we will recognize that we had only handful of materials if you were to ask what is the ingredient of the chip you will see only about 5 or 6 material that you could list, but today it is quite different we will see why that is the case and we will also talk about the device structure right. So, we will save it for the next lecture and uh, you know with that uh, uh, we will conclude the lecture for the day.